Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of Expats in Azores. It's been a minute, but I'm here back on the island and with a new friend, Tom Leamy. And uh, I met Tom over at our co-working space, downtown Ponta Delgada. Uh, if you haven't seen that video, links in the description. You should check, definitely check it out if you haven't uh, found a nice co-working space. So I met Tom through uh, the manager, Vitor, and we mutually had a connection through Uganda. So. Tom's going to share his story, a little bit about himself, but Tom, thanks so much for taking the time. It's my real pleasure to be here with you, Nathan. <laughs> Great. So well, we met because of Uganda. So give me a little background story, like what made you go to Uganda? Yeah. So in 2008, I was in college in Ireland. That's where I'm originally from. And um, we had the chance to go out on placement. So I was studying political science. So most of my class members would go and work in like the European Commission or in some of the like Department of Foreign Affairs in Ireland. But there was this small new program. It was the first year that gave graduates the chance to go to Uganda. Mm. And it was almost like an afterthought. It was like, by the way, <laughs> would anyone be interested in Uganda in Africa? And there was this auditorium. There's about 300 people in there. That's how they asked? Just yes. like that? Yes. Wow. And it was a new developing program. I don't even know if they knew it would work. And my hand just went up <laughs> automatically. Because uh, I have, since I've been knee-high to a grasshopper, yeah, yeah. I've been magnetized mm -hmm. towards Africa. It started yeah, with yeah. wildlife and yeah, yeah. nature and all that. So ended up going for nine months working in a rural school in Nyenga, near Jinja okay, in yeah, Uganda. Yeah teaching not political education but English, English and, okay. um, biology and agriculture wow. as well and it was just a life-changing experience wow. you know? and how long were you there for nine months that was mm. so it took in a semester and a summer as well and um, then came home finished the degree but Uganda was on my mind <laughs> it, it was like an itch that needed to be scratched yeah yeah uh, well, I, I find it interesting because he's been to Uganda for what nine months I've been there nine years and he speaks better Luganda than I do <laughs> yeah so. well I have been back about okay seven or eight back. times since. Oh, okay so you've yeah. been back right I remember you telling me like you went so what made you go back just the same reason for education purposes well, or so I went with with one of my very good friends uh, from Ireland Dan we went together and so we've always, we talked about visiting together. So when we graduated in 2010, we went there again for six weeks wow. um, together. And it's just, you know, we have a Ugandan family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And our students have now grown up <laughs> and they're so graduating university. So These true. like, um, uh, what do we call it? H2, H or S2, S3 students yeah, that yeah, we yeah. were teaching, exactly. senior two, senior three. Yeah. Are now doctors and you know <laughs> lawyers as everyone wants to be in Uganda. Yeah, right. <laughs> so um, upon going back, where would you typically stay in Uganda? Like, where do you typically? So in Nyenga, there's a we stay in the quarters of the school itself. Oh, okay, okay. And it's a beautiful building. It was built. It was an old seminary mm -hmm. that was uh, built, I guess, hundreds of years ago. Yeah. And we have our own quarters there, okay. and it's just community feel with all the students it's brilliant and then we teach in the poorer schools okay. that are around that but are, are you know it's very near the source of the Nile where we live um, in Jinja and uh, the, the Kampala side of the bridge right, but, right. so that's where we we stay but in Kampala where I've been going back the last time I was there 2019 um, I rented a house off my friend who owns bush pig oh, backpackers oh, oh yeah yeah yeah, okay. yeah and he has a house kind of on the compound mm, of that okay which i rented for a month very, in 2018. very very familiar with the place because my yeah. office is like down the street from yeah. that place yeah N near acacia mall acacia mall actually yeah. on the fourth level of acacia <laughs> <Yeah. Sable. laughs> so obviously you could tell we could talk about in right i know i was ready to say that like we could talk about uganda for hours but we're gonna get back and circle back to the azores so how long ago did you find out about the Azores and come here? How did you how did you get here? So the short version is my wife and I were living in Greece. We both have our own companies. I work in business psychology, helping companies perform better mm -hmm. and lower stress, and then individually as a as a coach as well. Um, and my wife works as a meditation consultant teacher. 
So we had freedom of location for quite a while. So yeah. we lived in Greece for a year, but the pandemic hit. Yeah. We wanted to be near the family, so we went to Ireland. We lived in a lovely farmhouse for a year there. But that was never the plan to kind of be there all mm. the time. So I wish there was a better kind of story behind this, but I just Googled safest places COVID-19. Oh, wow, wow. <laughs> and that's there was a list of, really? I, I bet it was sponsored by the Portuguese <laughs> government because <laughs> yeah. it was like the Azores, Madeira, oh, wow. Porto, all different places in Portugal and a few others. But the Azores was number one. And like quite embarrassingly, I thought, yeah, the Azores, isn't that near the Bahamas or, yeah, yeah. you know, over there? Yeah. And then I looked into it and was like, what? Where is this? There's and it's, islands And there? it's right near, I, it's and closer to Ireland than Bahamas. And <laughs> it's the most westerly point of the European Union. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then we were like, let's go. And it was both a, what we would say, a hell yes yeah, yeah. for both of us. For sure. So very quickly we came here for, for, or we decided we came here in October 2021 okay. Okay. for six weeks. And we wanted to feel out the place, see mm. what we thought of it. We, n- back then, there wasn't that many tourists arriving yet, so yeah. we had our pick of accommodation. Yeah, sure, sure. We were looking in places all over. And then we met Vitor yeah. in the one Solmar business center. Yeah. Check it out. <laughs> yeah. And he said, by the way, we have apartments upstairs. And I was like, oh. okay, let's see. And he showed us these apartments waterfront view yeah. duplex apartments it was literally where do we sign right exactly so yeah. we ended up staying there for the six weeks then we went to america for a few months okay. my wife is from virginia okay. for christmas etc yeah. back to ireland but then we came back here mm. the end of february rented the apartment again from uh, solmar for a few months and we've been here since february yeah. and we just quite de facto became Portuguese oh. residents. Oh, great. Yeah, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, yeah. Was that difficult for you? Because I know a lot many people have either asked questions about it or, you know, are curious. Was it difficult for you to get residency? It was super easy. It was basically a cakewalk because I have an Irish passport. Okay, yeah. So true. EU passport. Yeah. But the only reason I needed to do it anyway was so that my wife could legally stay here. Okay. Because she's an American American passport holder. Yeah. She has her Irish residency card, but <coughs> right. let's not recognize them. Ponta del Cano. <laughs> so she needed to get the Portuguese residency, and I was her her ticket. Well, there you go. <laughs> yeah. What was, um, or what has been your favorite part about the island so far? Well, I th- we both, we were both kind of, you know, I often, like, in my workshops with companies, help people see that a lot of joy happens in the unknown. Mm not the known yeah and the azores for us was all unknown and we didn't even look that much into it before we came here so everything every angle we looked at was kind of like wow this is like ireland and hawaii had a baby mm. that, that, that <laughs> was a our, good way to look at it yeah that was our first feeling <laughs> and um we were just taken back by a number of things first of all how good the infrastructure is in ponte delgado mm, yeah and that's, I mean, in terms of, of like roads mm. and uh, services and that, yes, but also internet. Yeah, internet. Is and um, like 5G and everything. So yeah. we, we really appreciate pretty much everything about living in the Azores. Yeah. It doesn't feel like you're kind of that's lost true. on a rock in the middle of the Yeah, Atlantic. that's true. Because I think some people, when they're looking it up, they're, they're thinking like, oh my gosh, it's these nine big rocks in the middle of the ocean. What could be there? Yeah. And I think there's some islands where it's not as established. And here you see a lot more established stuff, whether it's really fast internet or, uh, you know, it's just incredible. By the way, did you know one Solmar has the fastest internet on the island? Oh. It does. I didn't. Yeah, it does. Right. I believe it. Yeah, because uh, I've tested it. Like, I'll, I'm a really, like, I'm a goonie for these kinds of things. Like, yeah. where's the fastest internet? Uh, because also at times when you're, when you're doing meetings, which I want to transition into that, when you're doing online meetings or Zooming or streaming, yeah. you need fast internet. And, uh, yeah, they have the fastest internet. Um, so let's talk a little bit about your work. Like, what exactly do you do, how long you've been doing it, but how do you help people? I know you've told me a little bit about it, yeah. but explain that yeah. more. Well, to kind of set the table, I have to take the 10-year chunk of my 20s and early 30s into account where yeah. I worked in an industry called Nation Branding. Okay. So I would ultimately, with a small consulting firm, get attached to 
a foreign country generally to the government wow. and we would help market the country. Okay. So I led projects in 15 or 16 countries now around the world and um, that provided exposure to incredible leaders, yeah. both in the political sphere, but also the top 50 CEOs in each country. Mm -hmm. So I developed a real passion for seeing how, or like understanding how great leaders work. Mm -hmm. And the difference when I walk into one office and everyone is like hanging their head, <laughs> yeah. and you, it's a, like a toxic culture. And another office you walk in and people could not do enough for you. Mm -hmm. And it's like, ah, but like, you know that old saying, a fish rots from its head? Yeah. That's something I kind of began to see. Wow. But to, to jump, jump on a little bit, we, my wife had the same job. So we were working for the presidency in Botswana on our final kind of in-person assignment. Mm. And we just burnt out. Yeah. Because what we were doing was going into a country like Greece or, or Cyprus or Malaysia and working full on for three to six months with very little regard for our, you know, seeing the country or absorbing the culture oh. or like being in, it was just. You weren't really touring then, you were just no. basically no. working all the time. Oh yeah, it was just, wow. you go into an office, you meet the CEOs in their offices, the government, and I mean, you, you know, work hard, play hard, but we were so tired at the weekends, it was like we wanted to explore, but we couldn't. So ultimately we burned out mm. from that. And the, the thought in my mind was, there has to be a better way. Yeah. <laughs> so I was reading a few like books on transformation and, yeah. and um, training at the time. And I said in Botswana, look, I would like to try and invite some of the people I know mm. to the Hilton Hotel in Gaborone. I want to run a high performance masterclass. Wow. Surely to goodness, we picked up a few things from 10 years of working with the world's best fingers. Right, sure. um, let me try and kind of see how that goes. Yeah. And it worked well. Yeah. And right there and then we knew that I was going to quit my job. And um, we did. We resigned from that company. Wow. And we toured around the world for a while. Uh, that's when I went to Uganda again. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Indonesia, Bali, Thailand, all over the place yeah. for a few months. Figuring out I was testing my method. I worked mm. with clients in Uganda, okay. one of the big banks there. And um, it was all just kind of finding, uh, refining the craft yeah, yeah, sure. to get a, get a kind of sense. So now, fast forward a few years with some very hairy moments during the pandemic and very yeah. scary right, moments true, as well yeah, when everyone shifted virtually. Yeah. There was actually a period where between in-person trainings and coaching and virtual where nothing happened yeah. for a few months. Yeah, same like here. companies just yeah. like... It, it was deer in headlights, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So we, that's when I invested more in training to become a yeah. business psychology oh, practitioner, right, right. coach, all that stuff, right. because it wasn't reliant on just companies yeah. as well. Well, that's a good point because like I was sharing with you earlier, when, uh, when COVID hit, they locked down the airports here and you know, everything was at a standstill even, and I've been doing, I've been virtual or a nomad for like 10 plus years. Uh, everything stopped. Like er I think it was just a p moment, moments or months of fear where people were like, "What's going to happen next?" So I totally get it. But now, now that we're seeing people, um, you know, work is commencing again. But also, I think this has been a big push for people being virtual, mm -hmm. and I think that's given a lot of people more freedom to travel, still have their job, but be work from somewhere else rather than going to the office. Yeah. So that's a really good thing. And so sp specifically, what would you what would you help people now with in your line of work? What are you helping business owners do? Yeah, yeah, great. So, I mean, because the world has gone virtually, that's why we can both run our businesses from the Azores. Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> but I see my my work being kind of split in two. I still consult back to my own in my old industry, kind of very lightly, just to to kind of keep the the. Uh, finger in the pie mm, a bit, yeah. to use <laughs> an expression. <laughs> but my main work now is training and coaching, working with companies on two things in particular, high performance and stress reduction. Well, yeah. And more and more it's going towards stress reduction. I'm doing a master's in business psychology at the moment. Okay. But I see that a mind, a stressed mind, can't really perform mm. at its best That's true. sustainably over the long term. That's very true. So I really see the need 
for companies to deal with this issue of stress. In America alone last year, this is mm. Amer American Psychological Association statistics, $300 million of lost productivity Jesus. just related to absenteeism, uh, related wow. to stress and all that. So I'm helping clients from Sweden, across Europe, um, the United States. It's global. It's global. <laughs> it's yeah. global business. With because yeah. you know the human mind is the human mind. Yeah, it's true. So it's true. my method is really based around seeing pe seeing how stress is created, mm. and when people get a glimpse of that, how stress is created and maintained, they the mind clears the mind clears yeah. because you understand what's happening and when you understand what's happening you're not going to scare yourself as much <laughs> that's a good point <laughs> so yeah stress yeah. reduction high performance for companies and then individually i take people on coaching journeys for mm. three to six months oh that's great as well. so and also a little lighter life yeah and also you recently started a podcast too Okay, and you have a website. We can probably put those links in the description. Yep. Okay, so yep. we'll put those links in the description. You guys can check that out. Thank you for sharing that. That's uh, very interesting, and I think it's very needed, especially, you know, there's a lot of stressors these days on all different aspects of life, <laughs> not including business. Um, so a few last questions regarding Azores or being here in San Miguel. If someone who's watching this, because I actually get many people who have emailed me and contacted me and say, hey, I'm coming out to the Azores, are you there? Or, and I've met some people, actually. I have some friends that I've met uh, just from these, this series of expats in Azores. Um, so what would you tell someone who's thinking about either relocating, maybe they're thinking about Thailand, maybe they're thinking about uh, Indonesia, what would you tell them about Azores? The Azores is the next big thing. Mm. And why not come and dip your toe in the water? Like, mm. why not come and try it? Mm. See what it does for you, mm. you know? Because that's what we did, mm. and we're so happy we did. The Azores, it's like, you know, it's, it's almost like the product is access to nature. Mm, yeah. And that's what we have everywhere. That's I mean... Thing. One minute outside of Ponta Delgada, yeah. rolling green hills like Switzerland. So true. Um, with slightly better weather. Yeah. And um, <laughs> what's what's your favorite part in regarding like nature? Do you prefer the beaches? Are you more a mountains guy? What's been your favorite part about uh, the island? Well, I would say I'm more of a uh, like green nature guy okay. rather than blue. Yeah. But. Just exploring, like the coastal drive from Ribeira Grande mm. to Nordeste and those yeah. little villages along the way. So it was, it just like every angle is a postcard moment. It just takes your breath away. Yeah. You're like, I have to stop here. And then 500 meters up the road, <laughs> I have to stop here. So just kind of exploring and meandering through the island. Yeah. You can't really go wrong, you know, yeah, like then into inland to Furnish oh, yeah, yeah. Um, and the geothermal springs yeah. of furnish and the mountains the forests the lakes set sedage it's it really has something for everyone and it's it's becoming the whale watching capital of the world mm, as well yeah, yeah. you know that's true so it has so much to offer i would say come before there's this mass influx yeah, that's a good point yeah yeah i feel like it's at like it's such a, a great point where it's not overpopulated with a bunch of tourists but yet, still, some people are coming out and checking it out. There's also great surfing, too, on the north side. They, they've even built a statue. <laughs> they even built, like, a whole statue to a surfer or something like that. Like, yeah, it's in, the, it's in one of the roundabouts. They built this huge statue of a guy surfing because the, the waves there are just impressive. Is that uh, in Ribera? Ribe yeah, it's in Ribera yeah. Ground. Yeah, like, it's just a little bit down more uh, off the, off, not in the city, but down the, sh yeah. down the road a bit. And it's... But yeah, I mean, surfers like to come here too, and they just have a wild out time over there. It's yeah. it's great. Can I flip the strip for a minute and ask you yeah. what's your favorite part? Yeah, of the sure. Azores? My favorite part is as long as I've been coming here, as long as I've lived here, um, I feel like there's something new. Uh, if you're if you go out in you know for drives or if you go out there, I feel like you can find something new every trip. As long as you explore and you're not just like oh let's go back to the same spot. If you're willing to just look at a new, uh, take a different road or go to a new spot, you will find, that's what I love. I feel like, and I've been coming here my whole life and I've lived here at various different terms at different times. 
And I, every time I, I, I visit, I always find something new. And I think that's really cool. For one island, it's really cool. There's so many, you know, good places to go trekking and hiking, and then you have all the water activities. But I would say my favorite part is probably the when you when you start trekking and you just see the the inner beauty of this island. Not so much the the ocean side, but like the inner beauty. Whether it's waterfalls, I love waterfalls. Waterfalls and uh, the greenery inside is just so impressive. So those are my favorite parts. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. So uh, this has been great, and uh, I know you got some travels, and one day we'd like to interview your wife, because she also is living remote now, too. Mm -hmm. So in the near future, we'll get your wife on, and maybe we'll do a joint one then at that point. But it would be a pleasure. Yeah. And it has been a pleasure. Thank yeah. you, Nate. Yeah, thanks, Tom. So guys, this is another episode of the Expats in Azores. Um, if you liked this video, or you learned something, or you have a comment or a question, just throw it in the comments, and uh, we'll see you in the next episode. <laughs>